colleagues to give a welcome to country. Okay, it's going to be a short one because, you know, working through the all this process of working with Troy. And so my name is Dr. Carolyn Briggs and I'm, I'm also an AM now, of course. Got these indigenous type, white <laughs> European titles as well as my own. So um, I actually can graduate, graduate this year. So in the language afforded to me, it's Wamanjika, Marambik, Big Bunarong, Namde, Barupton, Ata, Willem. Welcome to our beautiful home, the lands of the two great bays. Wamanjika means come with a purpose. I want you to think about that purpose, but it's also about our guiding pillars or values. It's um, what we talk about is Yelenj, knowledge, and that generations of knowledge that we've been a part of our, what we understand about our own identity and what we had to go through the process of generations of knowledge, Yelenj. The next one is about respect, or Tilbrook. Tilbrook, we respect the laws of our country, but we also respect where we are today and paying respects to our elders. We also have the understanding Warungi Bik, the law of the land. And these are a part of the guiding principles of what makes us who we are today. The other one is about Jembana. So this is a part of understanding Jembana. Jembana means community. So in this moment, you're a part of this community, but you bring diversity. You bring um, a st an understanding that you come from a, another part of country. And it's about how do we unify community by understanding these guiding principles that make who we are. So that was a short overview, <laughs> not, but I thank you for your patience and time. So it is understanding coolant knowledge. Ungudjin. Thank you, Auntie Carolyn. Um, and um, you're right, you have um, so many uh, different roles and titles now that we we can keep moving through those as we continue through the conversation, but really, um, uh, hopefully, we get to some of those uh, conversations that we've had during this project about multiple ways of being in, of in the world, which, um, of course, uh, uh, is what we're here to talk about today. The project, 64 ways of being, the past two plus years that we've spent um, making this project, and and um, really today is going to be a relatively informal uh, uh, conversation because we found the best way to talk about this project is, well, to talk about this project. The best way to understand it is to play it. So uh, if anyone's played it, um, we also really welcome that you to uh, uh, speak with us about your experiences today as well. But let's get the opening slides up um, and we'll uh, start off by introducing ourselves, you know, the different roles that we've played on the project. Uh, and um, so if we could have the first slide. Love technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this really is a project that is about um, technology, but it's also about what you were just talking about, um, Auntie, which is place. And it's about place. place and demonstrating place. And, and, but how I have to Im inform myself in that place but how generations of knowledge have informed me, my, my role in place. But it's also about, um, I will fight for that place and that recognition because I'm aware that I don't fit into the Western paradigm of what they see as an Indigenous person. So, and that means I will fight it in the system that is your structures the law, but I have that privilege to be able to be able to have that opportunity to fight and pay for my struggles. I don't take from the government on that process, 
So my case is in the federal court now and because um, I had to define myself and I had to be, uh, my family had to demonstrate our continuing connection to place. So it's those sort of things we can all talk about it and we can all march but it's also taking the initiative to move forward and using the legal system against itself in a funny way. So we're talking about technology, the um, complexity of place, but the, also the experience of place. Uh, and we're talking also about urban play, how urban play brings you into a different relationship with place. But we're also talking about you, the players, and how you um, uh, participate in that process. So if we go um, right back to the first slide, and um, I don't suppose we have a clicker, um, otherwise I'll just give a little, when we want to move to the next slide. The very first slide. Yep, and then uh, how do we move through slides? Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Next slide, please. We still um, need humans. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're still readjusting with um, the real world and uh, using analog systems to activate digital systems. So that's um, pretty much on theme with um, the project 64 Ways of Being. Um, so before we start the conversation more, more um, formally and dive in, I um, just wanted to uh, note that if you're wanting to tweet, the hashtag for Melbourne Knowledge Week is MKW21. And uh, you can also tag us collectively at 64 Ways of Being. So move on to the next slide, please. This is what we're um, talking about today. And, and this is who is talking. So I'm going to invite, you've heard, already heard from Auntie Carolyn, I'll briefly introduce myself. I'll be um, uh, running the conversation. Uh, I'm creator of 64 Ways of Being. My name is Dr. Troy Innocent. I'm an urban play scholar and artist game maker based at RMIT University just across the road. And uh, my practice is really situated within public art, but it's informed by a number of other disciplines. Um, so my original uh, uh, kind of education is in, in um, uh, graphic design and I practiced as a, as a visual artist in virtual reality then moved into the real world around the time of the turn of this century and started working with public art practice and have, since then have been really engaged with cities and our relationships to cities. Um, and we also have here um, Pat Tui, if you want to briefly introduce yourself. Hey, yeah, my name's Pat. I'm the general manager of Millipede. Uh, we're an app design and development company based in St Kilda Road in Melbourne, or but increasingly over the last 18 months we've been based out of our own homes as well. And uh, we specialise in play-based and game-based uh, creative experiences. Great, thanks Pat. And we have uh, Rachel Vorbeck. Hi everyone, it's lovely to be here today. Um, so my role in 64 Ways of Being was to do with the language research, so I was on the hunt for untranslatable words that now um, underpin each encounter in the app. Um, but before that, in, well I guess in my past life and still <laughs> um, present life, I am a science communicator, so that means um, helping scientists to communicate their work to the public in a way that people can understand. Uh, but also I've done a fair bit of research in the past too. So um, some of you may have heard of the TV show called The War on Waste, um, the ABC's War on Waste. So I did a little bit of research into that. Uh, why did people adopt using keep cups so much as they did? Um, but also research into um, our community engagement and how can we engage more meaningfully with communities and local government. So yeah, that's me. Thanks, Rachel. So um, we're going to now uh, have a conversation. I'll just give you a brief outline of what we're doing over the next um, hour or so. We're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves around the project and how it came into being. And um, then we're going, 
finish about um, uh, 15 minutes or so early and allow a bit of time for Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions that come to mind, either online or uh, 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 for those present in the audience here, um, save those up for the end and we'll um, attempt to answer them at the, at the end of the presentation or the discussion, rather. But we do have something of a presentation because what I've, what I've um, done, we've li literally just launched this project two weeks ago, so it's really a time of reflection for us as, uh, as well. And so what I've done is um, I'm going to start off by talking to some of the major project themes and then going to uh, uh, open up and run the, the conversation along a timeline of how uh, we developed the project. So from the original um, kind of inception of the idea um, right through to uh, its launch two weeks ago. So we move on to the next slide. Uh, you know who we are now. And you can see here, um, when you're designing uh, any kind of playable experience or any type of, um, oh, that's me, thank you. Um, any type of playable experience, any type of game, um, you, you need what, what are called design pillars. And so really with this project, we, we, um, uh, these design pillars only really came into being probably about halfway through, but I'm going to start with those in any case to, to give you an idea of what we were attempting to make and why we decided to bring together such a kind of interdisciplinary group of people. The project has been, uh, when we launched at Acme a few weeks ago, the project was talk, uh, described in terms of extreme interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaboration. It's really hard to say all of those words together. That's a lot of syllables. So um, this I, you know, kind of idea of what happens when you bring together live art or theater um, with games and with public art, and when you bring together indigenous knowledge with you know, 64 different languages you know, uh, that, that live in Melbourne, and bring all those together um, in the city, what happens? That was really our starting point. But some of the threads that came out of that to make this tangible as an idea were things like um, the idea of urban play, and we're gonna talk about that a lot because it's really the, the underlying kind of foundation for the experience. But also this idea of um, you know, the different ways of being and what they mean. You know, what is a way of being? Like we're going to talk about that. And how does that relate to you? How does that relate to your own experience in the world? And uh, also the idea of the city and the city, how the city is actually more than one thing. You know, the most overt uh, and kind of, um, but also most overlooked um, expression of this is in fact the two knowledge systems, how they coincide like right. always, we're, we're right now here on, it literally on, uh, on the ground of two different nations, the Kulin Nation and, of course, Australia, because sovereignty was never ceded, so that nation didn't cease to exist. It's still here now. Always was, always will be, even using those slogans. And when, it was when you approached me about that, where are the markers? And, and it, for me, because this is built on a grid, and, but how do I find my stories within such a a complex a layout as what our Melbourne city looks like. And it is through that grid that I operate, trying to find where my, the storyboard of my ancestors, um, where are the markers, where, like I see here, it's about the journey of the eels, how we can unpack that in a visual presence. Um, also, where certain areas were really on the political beginning in the 1840s, demanding rights, where were those marks within a system that is very European concept. Um, and I had to, that wayfinding, where do I exist in a situ, where do we see our ancestors within a l larger place as Melbourne? I see all of you. I see the rich tapestry that you all make up and where you can be defined. But where do you define the first peoples of the Can you find us? And it's about developing wayfinding. My, my PhD was on the role of, and what that role and responsibility as an elder for our urban youth to get an understanding of complexities of First Peoples within this um, 
landscape, which when well, you can't identify us, you can't see us. It's that it's I've blinded. Our history has been blinded by 230 years. So how the land changed, how our presence has changed. So that was the part of the process I got involved with this, that an elder can pop up in this augmented reality and tell stories of places that are not defined in the map. So I have to unpack that and unpack myself within that. Everybody um, tries to tell stories, but they tell it from a, a very academic framework, I think. And that's where, that's the challenge. It's the challenge. I keep revealing myself in many different forms in the storytellings, the writing, reclaiming language, and my presence of my, my generations that went before, who lived and died before we were all here. So these are the things, if we have to go back past that 250 years, we played major part in the history of the development of this place. But it's not written. So they're the things about revealing that through these opportunities because I'm not a gamer. So I had to think, how do I work with the, this principle of what Troy's of the 64 way? Does this go down every now and again? So I want you to think about that and, and not research us as objects of the other. We're the beginning of now, and you're the beginning of the next chapters of being. So that's how I see that. Sorry? Yeah, definitely. The, I think a few key um, ideas to pick up on there, which will lead us into the conversation, are you know, what, what is wayfinding? So we might think of, uh, and these are some of the uh, ideas that, that really informed the motivation um, or behind 64 Ways of Being as a project as well. Um, but what, what is wayfinding? Uh, so of course we might think of wayfinding as something that we do with our phone, that we go into Google Maps and we type in an address. It might be State Library Victoria and you know, the, your device tells you this, the, the way to get here and that's super practical and useful. But it's also, a, you're, you become a bit of a drone. You become a bit of deta detached from the world because you're just being plotted through like, a, um, you know, like, like an Uber vehicle or any other kind of you know, GPS um, uh, uh, kind of um, located entity in, in, the, in the digital map. And so wayfinding is also finding your way in the world, which is the complete opposite to that. It's well, who am I and where am I in the world and how do I connect to this world? So when we're talking about this project, this is the original uh, motivation, is um, asking that question around how can urban play, you know, which opens up your imagination and your way of seeing the world and being in the world, how can that bring you into um, a, a perspective that allows you to, to find yourself in the world um, through experiences? Um, and so, working with, the, it's been a privilege to work with um, uh, 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 Auntie Carolyn um, and other Indigenous elders because of the, of course, these people, um, you are the experts on this type of uh, 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 kind of connection, connecting knowledge to place. And it is yeah. a collective knowledge. It's not, a, uh, not in isolation. It's not an individual knowledge. That's how we operated, as a collective, not an individual. And that, that's another point of difference, I think, about and that collective memory that is passed down over the generations and how it's valued. But it's sort of the, the, um, mapping this country to what it was before and what it is now. 
it'll be interesting if you, it's a challenge for you young people because woman Jacob was, and that's a power that challenge what is your purpose what is your purpose being here hopefully to elevate your ways of seeing yourself within this amazing part of our country which is now named Melbourne. So we'll be talking about the technology and about design, but we're also talking, going to be talking about place and how we connect uh, to place uh, and how we have tried to translate that um, way of being into a digital form, into an, we've made an app, but it's not an app. It's a show, it's a game, it's um, an experience. So, you know, we started out kind of thinking, oh, we'll be all clever with this technology. Um, but of course, as soon as we started talking with um, people uh, such as Aunt Auntie Carolyn, we found that there's a lot more to it than that. And of course, the language research, talking with different communities mm -hmm. about, you know, different words that are uh, related to place. Uh, and then bringing that into a digital experience. There's a lot of layers, and so we're here really to unpack those layers. And so one of the things that we started with, to, because that's a big question, right, is a model um, for you know, what is a way of being in relation to, because what, uh, well, that's a really philosophical question, and you, you know, there's plenty of texts I can direct you to uh, from my academic life to, to um, uh, uh, kind of explore that question. But for the purpose of our project in terms of you know, making this tangible as a game design, what are the different layers of a way of being? And so we broke it down into play, mood, language, and place. And so every encounter in 64 ways of being, um, whether it's in a laneway or in a public square or wherever it might be, uh, is looking to bring together these elements using the city as a material. So bringing together, you know, you think of, you know, this whole city, um, and not just the CBD, but the entirety of Melbourne, is an assemblage of different um, uh, cultures and languages and places and materials, and it's super complicated, but it's also super rich with experience. So how do we bring ourselves out of our phone screens to actually look through our phone screens and into that world and see it in a different way, see it through new eyes? So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today. So here's a timeline. Um, I'm not going to, um, we're going to move through this timeline uh, today and kind of talk about everything from the, uh, when we first pitched this project to Creative Victoria in October 2018, right through to its launch um, two weeks ago. Uh, um, um, and you know, now it's li li live on, on the street. So we're going to kind of talk through this process and the different steps that we took and I'm going to, um, along the way, uh, pose questions to um, Pat and Rachel and Auntie Carolyn, uh, and myself for that matter, um, to, to kind of tease out the layers of, of how the project came to be uh, and, um, and what, what we learnt as well along the way. I mean, for example, um, I didn't know that um, this was the site of the largest wetlands in Australia at the beginning of this project, but. Uh, now that now I do, and, and, and people that experience 64 ways of being will also um, hear parts of that story. So that's an overview. We're going to kind of start off with um, how, we, how we started, um, and we're going to end, end up with um, how it's going, I guess. So yeah. Uh, so the initial idea was, like I said, to, to kind of look to, to create, create an app that would bring together live art, public art, game design, create experiences of place that change your connection to place. But to make that practical, um, we had to kind of brainstorm the concept. So uh, right at the beginning, we had uh, Creative Victoria had launched this um, new program as part of Creative State called the Creative State Commission. And they were calling for projects that engaged with you know, public space, but that also um, ask people to, to uh, uh, move through space. So, you kind of to, so there was a, an overlap of public art and objectives around tourism and really upping the ante in terms of interdisciplinary collaboration. So we started out by thinking about, well, you know, what are the, all of the possible uh, kind of experiences that could come into being? And so uh, um, 
uh, to, to make that happen, I invited um, Millipede and also One Step at a Time like this, the Live Arts Collective who uh, couldn't be here today because they're in Singapore running another work, um, to really talk about, to respond to that initial idea. Well, how do we make this happen? So, Pat, do you want to talk about that initial process, that workshop we ran back then? To Sure. Figure out what, what we were making. I'll cast my <laughs> we're mind still back. figuring it out, um, but anyway. There's so many things you just said there, Troy, that I'd, um, I'd like to respond to in some way or form. But all right, let's, let's go back to uh, 2018 uh, when Troy first approached, approached Millipede. Um, it's a pretty interesting idea. We didn't really know what it was or what it could be. Um, and we probably weren't even sort of speaking the same kind of language. Uh, to each other as well. Um, maybe I should just, uh, without taking too much time, maybe I should just back up a little bit so you have a bit more of an understanding of what it is that Millipede brings to this project, uh, which is, I think, threefold perhaps. Um, on the one hand, we're game developers, right? So as game developers, we're creating the architectural framework of the experiences. We're, um, we're uh, implementing and refining the game design mechanics that you'll experience. And we're uh, writing the code that, that runs the app as you play it. And then on top of that, we add a, a level of um, what I would probably call uh, app design or app development, which is around the, the user experience design, which uh, in ensures that the, the, the app experience itself um, looks and feels a certain way and is intuitive to use and is accessible as well, and which is a, a, a really something that we're very big on as a company, but also something that's very important to 64 ways of being as well, that it attracts the, that, that it's inclusive, right? that it attracts the broadest possible audience. And then finally what we bring, which is sort of circling back to eventually, to o o October 2018, is, is what we might describe as project management, which is a, a bit of a, which is um, doing a lot of work, that word. It's quite an expansive remap, but um, I think in the context of 64 ways of being, you might say that it's about uh, enabling all of the participants and taking the creative input from all of the different voices that are part of this project and kind of uh, consuming them via the app and then dispensing themselves out to, to you, the players, um, which... Um, I think uh, sometimes I've, I've viewed our role on this project through a lens of perhaps um, uh, a creative pragmatism, maybe. Uh, and, that, and that was perhaps our, our role at certain stages, was to um, be a kind of um, uh, elastic band uh, around the container of possibility of what 64 ways of being could be. So to expand, to allow ideas and input in, and then eventually to or continually even to then contract as tightly as possible around the expression of those ideas so that we could get to something which was real, so we had a shared understanding and so that we could eventually actually deliver the project within the constraints of the project. There's always budgets, there's always timelines, there's always things that are going to put boundaries on what we're able to achieve. So uh, if we go back to uh, October 2018, uh, what we did was we got together with Troy, we got together with One Step at a Time like this um, in, a, in, a, um, it was in a room off Artist Lane in, um, in, in Windsor. And uh, we ran a series of um, design exercises. So we stepped through what um, some people might know as more of a, a user-centered uh, design framework, uh, where we did a lot of blue sky thinking to try to think of, well, what is an experience? What are the kinds of experiences you can have? What happens if you think about um, uh, an augmented experience in a place. What does that even mean? Like what, uh, what does it mean to augment reality? What, you know, what, what, is, what is reality? We see a lot of our games that are you know, pretty superficial. So how do, we, how do we come up with something that actually is going to uh, bring people along and, uh, and achieve a connection to place, which is you know, definitely, not a, definitely not a trivial thing to do. And I think it took us quite a long time to actually get to the uh, to um, even be talking about those kinds of things in that kind of way, uh, and to understand that we were talking about connections to place. I don't think that was 
wasn't obvious to to me anyway at the start or to or to a lot, lot of Millipede. I don't think it was um, more thinking about what are the possibilities of mobile devices and games and urban play, uh, and, and how do we give people a license to be playful in public. Um, so. Those are the kinds of things that we were that we were thinking about at the time, and we were also thinking again to go back to that kind of pragmatic way. We we're also thinking about how do we tell this story, uh, and how do we put a you know a, a budget against it and a timeline against it, such that we can actually you know advance uh, to the next stage and you know and convince Creative Victoria that this is going to be a, a, a really fantastic thing for for the for the city of Melbourne and, and for the players. So that was probably what we spent those first. I think it was about two to two to four weeks doing. Yeah, and from that we made a, a, a trailer that mocked up a lot of the experiences and um, because the, w the timeline was too short to, to, to build them, um, so it was a visualisation exercise as well. But I think what you said then was also really interesting in terms of process because, uh, um, you know, by way of example, and in fact one of the experiences we're going to talk about um, today uh, is the encounter in Elizabeth Street. And so... Um, for example, I would have a conversation with Auntie Carolyn who to told me this fantastic story about eels and we'll come back to that story as well. And then I know I'd go then to Millipede and to Pat and to say, well, you know, how can we get this story into this device? You know, how can we translate that into the con constraints of, of what you can do with the device? And, and um, a lot of the, the project was really about that, you know, kind of taking, um, uh, you know, moments and stories and experiences and and threading them into into a show that you experience via a mobile phone, which is um, not what really what mobile phones are doing uh, designed to do. Um, and so we had to really bend the rules of, of um, mobile app design a lot to, to make this happen. Um, moving on to the next stage, we're involved a lot in research and production, and I'm going to talk a little bit about place. Um, and how we researched locations, because that was really um, an important part of, so this is winding ahead to um, uh, when we're you know, um, being successful and uh, in um, uh, 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 attaining the, the, the commission and are now in production in, t in 2019. So this is around May, June 2019. Um, looking, just literally walking and looking and, and being in places, finding out where we could situate um, these ways of being. Um, but running in parallel with that was language research. And so Rachel at this stage um, was had started a study um, collecting words. So do you want to talk about that a little? Collecting words that are connected to place. Yeah, definitely. So um, it was a really interesting project for me to work on full stop from the beginning because, as I said before, I'm normally working with scientists and they're speaking in very... Um, black and white terms, everything is defined. I'm not the one helping them to define things because they're telling me what the definitions are. And suddenly I came into this project and I felt like the most scientific person on the team. <laughs> and so to sort of, as Troy already spoke about before, to define what a way of being actually is was a really important part at the start. And so the way that we ended up um, getting from this idea of a way of being or a way of existing in the world to an untranslatable word was to put a call out to different language groups and say, hey, okay, so we've got this app that's made in Melbourne by Melbourne. We need you to submit words that you think don't have a direct translation in English um, that are from another language other than English. And so um, we put out this survey and we got more than 250 words back. Interestingly, none of those words were Indigenous words, so it's so good that we had two um, sort of methodologies happening at the same time. One of those methodologies was Troy working really closely with Auntie Carolyn um, and my role was working with um, other cultural groups um, to try and, you know, get that rich tapestry that you were talking about before in Melbourne. So we started to get all these words that came back, but then the next part of the puzzle was, well, <laughs> how do we know that these words aren't swear words? <laughs> Could people be tricking us <laughs> that, you know, that, uh, that, you know, this word means a certain thing, but um, in actual fact, it's, um, you know, a different thing. So 
my role going forward was validating those untranslatable words. And so what I did was um, put a call out to more cultural groups and say, hey, we've got these words, can you please check that they mean what we think that they mean? And then throughout COVID, um, it's actually kind of fine for my role, at least in 64 Ways of Being, what I was able to do was just take it all online and do interviews with different people from um, different language groups. And so from May to September last year, I conducted 23 interviews with different speakers of languages other than English, and we spoke about these words. Um, these words could be things like, um, what are some examples? I wrote some down because there were so many. Um, one of the words is Heichun, and that's um, Cantonese. And for anyone who has played the app, um, this word is in the is in the experience, and it sort of means um, well uh, an energy field surrounding and connecting beings. But the example from the Cantonese speaker I was given was so when you're preparing and sort of psyching yourself up to go into a um, into a business meeting you need to psych yourself up. You need to go into that room with a certain level of composure and presence. That is your hei chun. So we don't have a word for that in English. How do you describe that in English? It took me, you know, a, a sentence then to explain it. So it was these kinds of words that I was trying to really dig deep for. Um, and then they eventually made their way into the app and then a whole other level of translation happened when those words and experiences were morphed into augmented reality experiences. That's right. And so each of these words uh, is given a home. Um, and we're doing this location research with one step at a time like this, looking at, I think we looked at maybe 50 different locations across the Melbourne CBD. The, the app in the end has um, nine different locations with the joining uh, pathways between those. So when you when you start, you hear uh, very a number of different voices um, introducing the experience from the top of the steps of Parliament, and then you're led through um, uh, down Burke Street, along Liverpool Street, to the first uh, encounter off Little Burke, um, which has the word Womanjika, and um, so which I always thought meant welcome, but of course it means more than that, doesn't it? Welcome. What is your purpose? So there's um, a, a, a question no that word comes with that. For welcome, <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's, it's challenged. You know, you come, you come on land. It's it's those sort of things. We don't have words in English, and um, and we had to try and work out. One, I had to f work out how to spell the words because it was never written. And then you have to adapt it to a sound system. And that I had to go and understand the, inter uh, the international language code for indigenous languages. So I had to go through that whole process. I f find other cultures seem to, how we have to constantly rethink, how do I put it in a structure that we can engage with each other. Do I lose part of me in that process to try, where English is very linear, digital ways is a very much a circular process of how we communicate. So when you're taking something and English can mean, and the complexities of English can have so many different ways of being interpreted. And I think people who become speakers from another language group find the difficulty in that complex structure that English can cause for other language speakers. So and that was my challenge because I could only have memories of words. It's not as if we're a group of people who can talk to each other. We don't have other speakers. 
I only have my cousin, but we only speak if we need to talk about how do we look at places and how do we introduce the intangible language code. We have to get, not like in New Zealand where they could, they can interact with each other because they're brought up with language of the Māori language. The Kiwis are brought up with understanding Māori language. But we've got so many language groups just in, in Victoria, across the stra this continent. They're all different. They're not the same. So you're working with such complexities of language codes and you understanding ling English or as a language person to interpret that back to meaning of place can have lots of different ways of speaking. And I think you found that. This the rich tapestry that we... I'm working with a student now and I think you met him the other day and he was looking at First People's Language and the rich tapestry that is now in our place now as a department in... Um, it's kept going off. It, it, he has done it through music or soundscapes of what makes Melbourne. When you travel through Melbourne, you're going to hear so many different people speaking so many different ways, and it sort of goes, oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, when we started the project, we thought, oh, maybe there's, we can find 64 languages spoken in Melbourne. Of course, there's way more than that. There's uh, you know, over 100, 100 easily, many more than that. Um, and so the other kind of, um, challenge apart from finding places to play. So, you know, there's a few guidelines for places to play and places to connect language. Um, you know, it has to be safe for people to play. So, you know, pl empty what? laneways with, <laughs> yeah, that's right, no, you know, places where, where perhaps cars don't go or that are enclosed that feel like a stage set. So really what we're doing here is looking for places that are ready-made uh, uh, game spaces spaces that speak to play already. So you walk into a laneway, you walk into a public square and it already speaks to you uh, as um, being a situation for something to happen. And so when we add the augmented reality layer to each of these um, uh, situations, we um, are, are, are kind of bringing um, urban play to the foreground in terms of situating an experience with place. And so early on in the project, we experimented with this um, uh, concept by um, making uh, a, a, our you know, kind of first test experience, because you can't build the whole project from, uh, uh, from you know, just write a game design document and then build the project. You've got to test and prototype and you know, try things out. So the first thing we built was a, uh, a multiplayer music player, um, which uh, we showed at PAX back in 2019. Um, and, and of course, at that stage, you know, PAX, if you're familiar with that, that environment, um, is uh, an enclosed environment, but, you know, it's not on the street. Uh, so we took the street to PAX, we built a laneway fragment that's currently now in Wesley Place, if you want to check it out as part of the Knowledge Week program. Um, but this also uh, may allowed us to have a conversation around, well, what do we mean by urban play? And in fact, you might be thinking that, no, what do these people mean by urban play? Is it Pokemon Go? Is it, you know, kind of like running around um, the streets uh, doing parkour? Is it, well, it's kind of like a lot of these things, you know, is it, it's a, 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 a way of being in the world where you slow down and you experience place, but you also put yourself in that place. And that's what we're inviting people to do with um, the augmented reality experiences. So. What happens when you uh, are standing in a laneway with two other people um, collaboratively making music um, that's, born, that, that's um, uh, connected to a piece of street art on the wall? What, what, what way of being is that? What about if you're walking through a portal or, or in a public square kind of playing with others? And um, uh, Pat, do you want to speak to some of those experiences? Sure. Um, one thing that might be useful to think about 
just on a very high level, hopefully not too simplistic, but um, how do we differentiate play from a game, for example? You know, and there's lots of different ways of looking at that, but when we talk about something being play-based, which is language that we use a lot at Millipede and has uh, quite a lot of um, connection to the way Troy uses urban play as a term, for example. Um, one way you can think about that is um, games tend to be about uh, mastery over rules or conditions or restrictions. Right? They tend to prioritise victory, uh, failure, competition. Yeah? Whereas, uh, and, and so because of that, they tend to create quite tightly controlled worlds. Yeah? Um, so in terms of a mobile phone game, that tends to be a, a very immersive experience, but also an experience which is very much lives within the phone itself, underneath the glass of the phone, if you like. Uh, when we talk about a play-based experience or play in general, uh, we're referring to something which prioritises discovery uh, or adventure, uh, where, where players need to be uh, creative participants uh, within the experience themselves. So, uh, uh, so to get back to the, the question, I suppose, of how you play in public or, or, or why you might want to play in public, um, which is also interesting to think about, uh, there's, there's there's, there's no particular reason why, why you would want to play in public, but you also don't need an excuse to do so either. And um, that's something I think uh, Troy and ourselves are, are pretty aligned on, is that as, as adults or as city dwellers or as um, Melburnians, whatever we want to call ourselves, we don't give ourselves a license to play publicly uh, very often. We tend to need a, a, an excuse. Or, or, or something else. We're, we're happy to play a game, right? We're happy to um, throw a frisbee or, or kick a footy, but we're not necessarily happy to be um, just by ourselves or perhaps with just a few friends or family um, in inventing something and being being playful in in a space in public. Um, so I, I do hope that we have uh, created, um, you know, a bit of a license to do so through 64 ways of being, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that you're making it your own experience uh, in, in, the, in those locations. Um, and yeah, I think finding the right locations to do that is really important. Um, it's pretty, uh, it's augmented reality can be dangerous in public if you choose the, the, the wrong spaces to do it. And it, and it can also be quite uh, confronting. Uh, as well, but the confronting aspect of it is, is, is I'm quite okay with. Like I think it's actually quite interesting to um, be doing something that is quite private to you, um, but doing it in a public space. So walking walking down an alleyway, having a, a playful experience while there are other people around you, and you're kind of in having to interact with them, but you're also um, your experience of being in that place is quite different to the experience that the people around you are having. And that can be quite a, quite a confronting thing. And um, also pretty, it's pretty interesting. You know, it draws you out of yourself a little bit. So maybe it doesn't have to make you a bit of a performer in a space. Yeah, we're really taking people out of their comfort zone. Because you're used to, if we're talking about theatre, um, you're used to being in a situation as you are now where you're sitting in the audience and we're doing all the work. And this experience asks you to do some of the work, um, to make you to kind of participate in the work coming into being. Um, and so, uh, what that really means is that um, you know, w when we when you were talking about uh, the um, you know kind of idea of what is play in public space, you know, why would we want to play in public space? And the reason for that, I think we really got the answer to that last year um, because we made this project or started making this project before COVID. But last year, uh, when we're all in lockdown and we're all kind of kept away from cities and you know, we're just in our local neighbourhood, we came to a new appreciation of place, but also came to a new perspective around, ah, well, you know, how did the city come to be and why is the city that way? And maybe it could be different. And so, um, our project is also part, partly what you might call speculative design. That is, 
thinking about not only, as I said at the start, the city that is, but the city that could be. And when you're playing 64 Ways of Being, we invite you into that imaginative, speculative, reflective state of thinking about, ah, oh, well, you know, um, this place used to be different. It used to be a wetlands. Or what could this place be 10 years from now? Um, what does this place mean to me? What experiences do I have connected to this place? Or what new experiences do I have now I've slowed down and, and played through this app? It could be just fun as well. You don't have to <laughs> kind of have a profound life-changing experience. We'd love it if you do, but but um, uh, but it's it's it, but there's the, as a, it's a, it's an artwork and it's a game. So it's kind of talking to all of these different layers. But um, also, kind of to speak to that, um, we where are we here? Going too far. Um, in December, at the end of 2019, before the world started going completely mad. We built a prototype and we had the first three locations in the experience that you can see up there, which is a third of the journey. Uh, and um, uh, we made a playable prototype and invited all of our play testers that we've recruited at PAX and other events to try it out and tell us what they thought so that we would know whether we were on the right track. And um, uh, I don't know, Rachel, you played through that. Do you want to talk about some of your experiences and responses that we had? That's the one I was looking for. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I felt, uh, I sort of felt really in the project but really out of the project at the same time, which was, positioned me as a really good play tester. So, um, I didn't really know what the experience would be like when I picked up my phone and I haven't told Troy this, but I was explaining the app completely wrong at the start to my friends and family. <laughs> And then I took part in the play test and thought, oh my goodness, this is, it, how can I be having a mindful experience whilst looking through my phone? It just felt so bizarre because, you know, I'm sure um, we've all, uh, you know, done something like yoga or even had a mindfulness app. You know, it's putting your phone away. It could be listening to your phone, but it's not engaging with your phone to be mindful. So to be using my phone as a platform to be in the moment was just really strange. And so one moment that I distinctly remember was walking down this alleyway and there was this person at the end of the alleyway just sitting there having lunch. And meanwhile, I'm holding my phone up and I'm walking through a portal <laughs> and that person has no idea that I'm walking through a portal while he's just eating lunch. And so in that moment, I thought, this is so exciting. I'm experiencing something completely different to this person. I'm, you know, there couldn't have been more of a, you know, he was sort of just eating his lunch, looking at his phone, and I was looking at my phone, experiencing this alleyway in a way that I never thought that I would. You couldn't have more of a juxtaposition of our experiences in that alleyway. So, yeah, for me, I think it made me even more excited to be working on the project. And, yeah, I, it put everything into context, especially because there were just so many inter interdisciplinary players. So, yeah, if, if you haven't played it, that's a plug to go and play it, I think. Yeah, and you, and you, mentioned, uh, you told me at the time that... Um, you, when you experienced that portal, there was a, a, an audio um, track that said, um, look for the door that's never been opened. And then you opened the door and that was the kind of connecting point. So there was a number of things that we learned from that um, prototype that then we took into the design. And, um, and as, as Pat will tell you, the, one of the challenges with this is we could have just stopped there and said, well, that was an interesting, um, that we've created three ways of being. The project's called 64 Ways of Being. So, you know, we're, you know, how do we do the other, <laughs> the, the other 61? How do, we, how do we scale this up? And so really the next step was um, what we call platform development, where we took some of these ideas. We've, you know, tried out a slice through, we've tried a slice of the experience, tried out a few things and gotten feedback. Well, we go through the layers of feedback, but there was good, there was bad, there was in between. Uh, and how do we translate that into something that is scalable? Um, because we're going to, you know, now create another six ways of being in the city. 
Um, and so we went through a stage of, of, um, of templating, and this is in um, uh, February 2020, so pretty much the last time we were all together in one place um, until this year. Uh, and so and it's really great that we got that moment because we were able to really come together on a collective vision. Uh, I think that was the moment where we started to get an idea of what the project actually was. Uh, yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, oh, what a great slide, yeah. Um, perhaps it's useful then, um, particularly if we start thinking about um, you know, the eels encounter, say, as, as, as something, as a topic of, of conversation. Um, how do we go from this to, to that you know, incredibly rich and you know, really uh, affecting experience that you do have down there on Elizabeth Street? Um, well, it's not, yeah, it's really not, it's not magic, but it's, um, it's actually quite mechanical uh, un underneath and there's, and there's a real reason for that, right? As Troy says, we need to scale this up. It needs to be not just a few experiences, it needs to be 64, it needs to be become a platform essentially is what has to happen because that's the only way we can feasibly deliver all of these experiences. It'll be impossible otherwise. So what we need is a set of experience templates essentially that leave enough room to create really diverse, interesting and meaningful experiences that connect to place, but also share enough components that um, eventually our job as app developers kind of, it keeps diminishing the amount of work we actually have to do to bring that into being. And then what, what we're doing is enabling different content creators, different voices um, to come in and contribute to that and to actually make the experience. Um, so for something like the, the Eels encounter, for example, how that started off from my point of view as a developer is it's actually taking one of those experience templates that consists of a, uh, well, there's a, there's a description, I think, of a flocking algorithm up there, separation and alignment and cohesion. It's, um, uh, yeah, it says it's a pretty well known algorithm, right? Um, but that's, that's the behavior that um, governs the way that eels behave in space. And then there's some volumetric AR applied to that, which is configurable by Troy. And then there's a time-stamped audio passage, which one step and other voices can contribute into. And then you put the, those three things together uh, in a carefully chosen place, and you end up with an experience, which is you know, much more than the mechanical sum of its parts. And that's what all of those templates are designed to do. And, th and that's, um, that, that's the reason behind creating an experience platform is to make something that's scalable, that's economic, that becomes feasible to then become 64 ways of being or to become a discrete other way of being somewhere else, you know, across the country or yeah. wherever. And, and also something that we can play with. Um, so, uh, so you can see there on the, the left some of the original um, concept art that I came up with around what we call the cloud of glyphs encounter. That is, you're in a you're in a space standing somewhere in the city, and there's all of these beings floating around you. Um, and in this case, you know, if you're thinking back to that model that I showed you at the start around what is a way of being, the idea here was to bring together uh, uh, an indigenous word, which is beek. Uh, with a location, which is Elizabeth Street, with a flocking algorithm, which, um, who's familiar with what that is? It's just a computational science, uh, sorry, computer science model for creating things that, that, that kind of move around together as a flock, like a flock of birds or a flock of fish or a flock of eels, so that's not the right term, but a, a group of eels. And, um, and, uh, and so, we, and um, one step had found this fantastic track uh, by the um, uh, orb weavers who, uh, which was about eels. And Auntie had told this story about the eels that, that live underneath Elizabeth Street and how that actually used to be a creek. And so bringing all of these things together into a particular moment, it's about two thirds of the way into the Melbourne CBD journey. You arrive at that tram stop overlooking Flinders Street Station and you open up um, a portal in the ground 
and the eels flow up and start dancing to the music. And at the same time, you hear part of the story, which I don't, you do want to share the, the story, not the whole story, but... <laughs> well, it, it is, and, and I had to learn how to see the city and unpack it. And so part of it was, how do I unpack the city and, and try and rebuild the journey path of the eel? So we were able to somewhere track that the different ways the movement of the eel and where the eel then journeys further away, but we found where the, it was like a portal <laughs> for those eels to come out. That were, so you, you, it's that making something that was intangible and it, I had to, it, it starts, what we thought was starts from where Melbourne Uni, going under there and travelling through Bouverie Street down into Elizabeth Street and trying to track those creeks, and it was un trying to understand how those creeks join up and the journey path of the eel, and, and what we tried to make sense of the journey's eel, of where it goes, and when it comes back, and re follows its own, it has its own sonar, our eels in Australia or our eels in Melbourne, we call it, does this journey. And it's, it does a journey of a, what are they, an infinity, or that symbol of affinity, the eight. So it goes and travels and leaves and the new eels, the birth of the new eels, and they follow the same track. And we know when that happens is when there are major indicators like our ecology that remind us that the eels are moving when we can track or when we can dine on those eels. So it's all about understanding the cyclic movement or the movement of our ecology or our understanding we also look to the stars and we look to the... Everything is an indicator. They're our markers that remind us when it's time to dine on our beautiful experience. So it is... It's something... And I had to do it. Walk, you look, Willem, track, Jinnan, track. Um, our... You look, Willem, is we are the people of the river. So I had to understand the movement of the eel, understanding how we perform and understand the journey cycle that for 80,000 plus years of memories. So it's, it's difficult to try and put it, and I was thinking how to, would that, because I'm not a gamer, I have no idea how to make an app, so this was, if I'm going to be up to speed of transi uh, transitioning that knowledge to our urban youth, I have to use your thinking, your way of understanding the way you, the world that you operate in. Not my world. My world's moving on. My world keeps adapting and changing. Yeah, but you talk um, about uh, urban indigenous culture as being something quite unique to Melbourne. Yes, and that is understanding how I un <laughs> can develop markers using your symbols that what I could know somewhere in that vicinity was a story being told and those stories of reliving those stories, using that. So that's bringing it to the urban, from ancient knowledge to the urban situation and that's a part of my responsibility and re like configuring it into a western model that's a western model it's not that I ha we all now adapt to 
um, because it's a vehicle. We use it as a, an app that we can um, map, like GPSing places. We can use it as an app that can tell us the type of tree, you know. So it's those things that we're starting to access to learn how we can transmit that knowledge in those processes. It's yes. a big journey for me as an elder, me in um, changing the ways of telling stories, um, me being a part of something that's bigger than myself and having to ground myself into that little object um, has been a massive experience. So uh, it's, it's people like yourselves that help me form a, a new discovery. And it's because if I, the way I see the city, one, I had to adapt to a new process because it's on the Manhattan grid and then I, how I navigate myself through the city and remembering intangible knowledge and bringing it to a tangible space so that you get to see it without having to read it in an academic form. Yeah, and that's... It's about a lived experience of my ways of being. It's my lived experience that I need to share and it's vehicles like this gives me that opportunity. So it's our hope that with this project, the ubiquitous mobile phone doesn't just operate as a communication device or as a way to access memes, um, but as a, a, a arts and cultural platform, as a site of lived experience, so that when you play 64 Ways of Being and you arrive at the end of Elizabeth Street, you learn not only learn something new, but you experience something new. Because those e eels are still travelling underneath They're Elizabeth still Street, and there's a, as a, you can see actually, if you go along uh, outside Flinders Street Station, you can look back along the Birrarung, and there's, you can see where the water empties out into the Birrarung, and um, you know, still flows today. And that's one of the young fellows said he, he followed those drains, and he was able to experience through those drains the journey of the eel that I told him about. So. He did his kayaking through the trains, which I was overwhelmed by. Very but brave. Apparently, very brave. But I hear that there's a lot of graffitis. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a, a it's a also a part of their art story. Yeah, the uh, cave um, clan has been running what Melbourne, is it? Uh, in Melbourne for some time. Yes, yeah. which I didn't know. And these are these young explorers. Are, are teaching me a way of seeing the city too. Mm. So there you go. It's a it's about that shared experience, and that one there's a way of both ways of knowing. And um, this image here, um, we're actually running. I just realised we're running over time, so I'm going to uh, move quickly to conclusion. Um, of where we landed with this process uh, um, and this was a, a key point along the journey um, was actually defining the journey and, and making all of those connections you know how because it's one thing to say oh there's multiple ways of being but how do you lead people through them and so this is the map that we ended up with in terms and this is not a map that you would be familiar with it is a map of Melbourne or um, but it's a map in terms of what we call emotional cartography so that idea of how do you remap your way of being in the world in terms of your emotional experience. Not just Flinders Street, Swanson Street, um, you know, RMIT, State Library, you know, we know all those landmarks, but what about you? What's your map? Everyone in this room has a different map of the city in their head. I, I certainly did with laneways um, because I had to go through, it was a very emotional experience, very personal emotional experiences. But I, I, w I knew enough to navigate myself through laneways to have that sense of that I wasn't alone in these journeys. So I had to look out and call out for 
my, uh, allowing myself to express that pain through that journey, through the laneways. And I, I think there was success somewhere out of that journey. But it was something I could remember as my child, knowing that there's what we call shadows, shadows that the un... of, of ancestors, you know, and I needed them to be there in presence for my allowing myself to vent my pain. So I had to navigate through these pla places but luckily there was a great outcome for me. And I, I guess if I wanted to reiterate the point that um, First Nations peoples had augmented reality before there was augmented reality in a way. So it's an analogy, but it, 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 you know, it speaks to perhaps that experience of being able to see multiple layers of, of the world. And, and navigating through those patterns. It is about those patterns and how patterns move. You know, they're not, they're not these structured things. It's a, it's a different way that we see our world through different patternings. So from there, um, once we had our journey, we could uh, get a sense of the entire experience. We then um, uh, got to the end of production, so that journey happened around June last year. Then October last year, we were able to go back out in the world again. We actually found that the game had gotten at, had gone out of sync with the city um, while we'd been in, in lockdown. So we were excited, but also had a lot more work to do. Um, but you can see there also some of the work that was happening, I guess, when we couldn't get into the city. So you can see a screenshot there from um, Unity, which is the game engine that we used for the project uh, using the Vuforia Augmented Reality Library. And that's an image of what Pat was talking about before. That's the eels encounter as I saw it in my studio. Um, so you can see that uh, there's a, a volume in which the eels are contained as a bunch of scripts and sync points to music. So the whole thing is choreographed um, in connection with place and time and the player. Um, and so that, uh, uh, I won't go into exactly how everything works there. I'm happy to you know, kind of chat with anyone afterwards if you're curious. But um, the, the uh, 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 templates that Pat was talking about before were incredibly useful during lockdown because we were able to experiment with things um, in, the, in the, the room out the back of my house that I spent you know, 10 months in last year. So we then ended up um, launching um, two weeks back and um, invite you also to, to, to play the game if you haven't already uh, and experience uh, nine ways of being uh, with more to come. We're developing Fitzroy Collingwood, uh, Footscray, St Kilda as, as future sites. So there's many more stories to tell. But I thought I'd finish up with, um, well, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. But also, um, just asking everyone here, you know, what is 64 ways of being to you? What is your experience of, of, of perhaps not the project, but of, of, the, pla of the, the, you know, when you've been out playing it, what, what, what stories can you share or tell? Okay, I'll go. Uh, <laughs> I think it's changed a lot o o over time. Um, I don't think it is one thing. I think we can talk about it in a, in, a, in a lot of different ways. And much like Troy, when I do talk to people about it, I end up coming back to um, trying to ask people to go out and discover what it means to them and, and to you. Um, but that would be a lazy way to answer this question. So um, I... It was quite a, there was quite a long time because of COVID, because of lockdown, because of separation from the nuts and bolts of the project in my role, where I didn't experience 64 ways of being for about a year. Okay, I experienced the initial playtest version and then it actually wasn't until um, about a month ago or thereabouts that I was able to do the whole full playthrough of the first experience. and. Um, I found it was it extremely rich and curious and and rewarding experience. It was actually I found it a lot more emotional than I 
expected it would be, uh, particularly um, in certain locations. I don't know whether that was just my personal response or not. Um, I found the eels encounter, for example, to uh, yeah be a really affecting personal experience. I mean, that's a that's an area of that's a location within Melbourne that I'm super familiar with. I would probably sound intimately familiar with it, right? I've lived and worked and studied and walked through Melbourne for 20 years and I've probably crossed that, that area there in front of um, Ben Street Station hundreds if not, thousand, if not a thousand or more times. Um, but I've never actually stopped there. Um, and I've, I've never had a moment there kind of to, to, to reflect and to be, and to be um, kind of by myself while also surrounded by all of that momentum of, 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 of trafficking humans and people. And um, yeah, I found myself uh, transported. I found that I um, learned some things that I didn't know about that place. And I felt a, I did feel quite a connection to that place. It ceased to sort of be an abstract thing. And the stories of the eels and of the flow of nature under the, under the street, that wasn't, it wasn't, it was no longer, you know, not, not just a story, which is maybe the wrong words, but it, it became concrete in a way. Uh, it, 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 bec it became something that was very much connected to where I was and what I was doing and what I was feeling. And that it made me, um, yeah, it made me feel and learn. And it also made me sort of perhaps afterwards a, a little bit proud that we'd all managed to come together and, and, and create that create that moment of my own understanding, which is funny, funny maybe that, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I probably want to reiterate, um, it was a process of extreme interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, something that nobody's done before, uh, and we're still learning from it. We're in the next phase of the project, and um, so we're still making 64 ways of being, uh, and the, um, uh, we're getting the kind of, uh, signal to wrap up now. So what I'm going to do is, <laughs> oh, I just wanted to put the last slide up <laughs> so that um, our people could have a, a, a link to follow up with any questions or with any um, further, uh, uh, inform if you want further information about the project, there's also a podcast called Playopolis. So um, if we put that final slide up, I invite you to play and get in, in touch and um, I'll speak yeah, with us yeah. further about the project because we didn't um, get to questions, unfortunately. But thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And um, yes, thank you. <laughs> it's a whole big experience. Cheers. I had to do astrophysicists <laughs> the other day, and I thought, how am I going to navigate myself through this one? But it was an amazing process that I was able to adapt to. So it, it's the challenges. There's the challenges, even for older people like myself. Um, Doing a PhD was a, a massive challenge, but um, I'm in my 70s, so I have to think about how do I navigate it into the modern world of these, as what was said. So it's your challenge. My challenge is to understand that communication network that you have for... So, you know, I'm, I'm impressed with a lot of young people, because I don't have that privilege of playing, but it is that way of thinking, and I, I'm always trying to understand. I open myself to understand my way of living, and uh, but understanding your experiences too. I'm good. Thank you.